Hello and welcome to the Silver Shemmings Ash Construction Law Podcast. I'm Sean Lothorpe, a business journalist, and I'm joined by two of the firm's construction lawyers, partner Henry Hathaway and associate Lachlan Steer. Thank you both for joining us. Thanks very much, Sean. Thanks, Sean. OK, uh, in this episode, we're going to look at why it doesn't pay to have delays in construction projects. We'll be looking at understanding the legal implications of time when it comes to delivering a project, what happens when things overrun, and what you can do about it, both before and after a project. Um, Henry, let's start with you. Um, I guess we should uh, look at time generally, and it's important to construction projects uh, in, in the round. Could you just talk us through that? Uh, absolutely, Sean. Uh, d- delays affecting construction projects affects everybody. It affects from the funds right through to the developer, right through to the contractors and the subcontractors. Ultimately, it costs money. Uh, the basis of trying to prove that and who pays for that is always going to be an issue and it continues to be an issue. Nothing ever runs to time, though, does it? (laughs) Certainly not in construction, Sean. Um, But there are mechanisms. Again, we've talked about before in other podcasts, we've talked about in breakfast seminars. It's about putting the things in place right at the very start, at the time of the agreement, as to when it goes into delay, how do we stop delay, and what do we do about it if it does go into delay. And how can you do that? What sort of things should you be looking for? A lot of different points will come down to how the parties actually have the intention of how they're going to carry out the works. What is the programme? What's the baseline? What did the parties intend as to how they would undertake the works in terms of the timelines and how do they agree that? The second point is, how do we measure that and what do we do about it when those things go wrong? I mean, Lachlan, generally, when when we talk about the general position with regards to time, I mean, what are we sort of really looking at then as, a, as an overview? What, what, what do you think sort of clients should be aware of? Well, in terms of the general position um, with time, you're going to have a series of dates um, and you will be obligated to complete the works before uh, an end date there. Now, one quite interesting aspect of this is um, if time is at large. Now, if time's at large, it's a very bad thing for the employer or the client. Yeah, what do you mean by time at large? Sorry, Where the contractor is obligated merely to complete the works within a reasonable time. Right, so it's not being pinned down. Exactly. Um, That doesn't mean they can just delay and delay and tarry um, inordinately. That's not what it means. What it means is that there aren't a a strict set of dates they have to adhere to. Uh, And with that, there are several implications of that, which we'll come on to discuss later. But essentially what it does is it uh, elongates the time just to a reasonable time. And good practice, though, would suggest when you're you're kind of setting out your framework or, or your contract that you do actually pin these things down, I think, as you as you were suggesting, Henry. Yeah, I think it's down to two elements here as well, how parties on a practical basis approach the problem. Sean, it's, it, you've said it already, like, no, delays happen again and again in projects. Okay, so there are trends and things do repeat themselves as the causes of delay. Um, a lot of the parties, a lot of our clients, we would be trying to educate them to say that these things do reoccur again and again to f- spot those trends and get those points actually addressed at the time of contract with the other party as to how they're going to deal with them and start actually identifying them. The second point is, what does the contract actually say how we're going to deal with them? Mm. One of the biggest uh, real instances that everybody who comes to our table, Lachlan, would be that they don't actually understand in a lot of instances instances what the contract procedure is and how they are actually to treat it. Yeah, I think that's um, a very relevant and, and truthful point, Henry. I mean, one of the key aspects in terms of what, uh, us giving advice is, are you entitled to just extra time or extra money? And often, um, of course, this, this is different between different sorts of standard forms. But equally, it's very common that our clients don't necessarily always have a firm grasp on what their entitlement is. You know, just by way of example, if we take something like weather, you know, that would be what we would describe as a, a neutral event where you, you're likely to get the time for it, but not some money. And it's just making sure everyone knows precisely what their obligations and rights are under the contract that then enables them to properly apply for what they're properly entitled to. Is this what you mean when you talk about extensions of time? Is that is that what's covered there? Precisely that, um, which... Uh, is the elongation of the time for completion of the project what does that due mean? to Sorry. <laughs> so an extension of time yep. is putting back the end completion date um, in recognition of a delay uh, caused to the project. Uh, I mean, how do you prove that? 
how do you prove that a delay has taken place? Well, there's two parts. And again, like you no, know, we, we've talked separately in another um, point about claims. Um, but there's always two elements uh, to proving uh, a point. Uh, first is establishment and the other is basically quantum, how to quantify it. So the establishment point is always taken from what the contract says. If somebody wants to know, am I in delay, essentially, in the contract, it will give you the parameters of when you are in delay. So we need to reference that. We need to establish that we have a right to claim for an extension of time to adjust the completion date in any event. Once we do that, the next point is, how do we quantify it? Again, Sean, we're back to the same point that when we get these delays coming to our tables, to our desk, it's generally at the end. Mm -hmm. What occurs is that we have to go retrospectively, which is an expensive process. Anybody who's ever been involved in long delay claims will know how expensive it is to actually try and look retrospectively. This, this is a continuous process. If we get it right, uh, right from the baseline program at the very start of the project, and we measure that mm. with the techniques that's available, then we can go throughout. Well, let's just pick that up. You're talking about sort of measuring there. I mean, what what sort of techniques are available here? I mean, how, how do you measure this? Because what, what thing I'm interested in is, does everybody have to sign up to this? Because I may be thinking, well, I, I couldn't have foreseen that delay. I, I didn't realise I couldn't get the staff, whatever. Has everybody got to sort of sign up before you can sort of push this through? It, it starts exactly from the common intention of the parties. And what we call that is the baseline programme. Right. And what we can then do later on is measure off that baseline. The baseline sets out what the common intention of the parties is and was at the time, and therefore what is happened, what is as executed. Now, we have different points to which we won't have time today. We're talking about link logic and dependencies about different items. We've even got different aspects of concurrency. Those elements do come in, but the quantification and the evidence that we keep on talking about to demonstrate your entitlement is first and foremost. Yeah. Um, an odd question, Lachlan, but do projects ever run to time? Um, I'm not sure we've encountered too many, Sean. Uh, it tends to be a trend that things uh, take longer than expected and cost more than expected, um, and that's just more... Plus, we never heard of good stories either. No, it's always it's problems that we deal with. Indeed. So if, if nothing ever actually ever runs to time, you'd, you'd be a fool not to, to consider this, wouldn't you? But you would certainly be, Sean. But you'd also be a fool to um, not adhere to your obligations under the contract. Um, there's recent case law that shows that if uh, when assessing applications for an extension of time, you refuse to assess them or you ignore them, um, that the, the contract will then operate such that you may end up with time being at large, as we discussed earlier. And um, if you are administering the contract from a client's perspective or the eventual employer, that is something that really should be avoided. Um, Henry, programming and delay analysis, are they one in the same or are they different things? One, one lends itself from the other one. Um, ultimately, what we're saying is that we have our baseline, we'll turn to that baseline, and then we have to measure. Um, it's, it's the amount of things, Sean, that you can actually achieve when you get a good programming system in place. You can assign resources, you can actually use it for cash flow, you can actually use it then for your own business overall as to performance in terms. And we spend a lot of time, especially with the SME market and our larger clients, actually developing these type of techniques that they can actually project prospective problems in the future in terms of their money. Yeah. And we use that because it is a commercial and we've got to get to the practical reasons. First of all is to stay outside of the spoot. Um, but it's, it's an iterative approach and there are techniques involved within that that are good practical measures, but also it's just good business sense. So what's delay analysis then? Is that just keeping tabs on how things are going? Is it tracking? Essentially? Yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, we're back to the establishment and we're back to the quantum issue of how we actually use those techniques. We can get different points and it depends always on the level of information. It depends on the quality of the records, the evidence that you have. Yeah, let's pick up that point, actually, uh, Lochan, because I think we're talking about communication as well, aren't we, and, and how, you, how you keep all the parties informed of what's going on. I mean, can we look at that process, uh, I mean, in, in, in relation to this and, and perhaps the extensions of time as well? Yeah, certainly. Um, it, it's a prudent um, process to be constantly submitting your updated programme because ultimately, from your perspective, you're showing uh, the strengths and weaknesses and progress in terms of how the project is progressing. And also the recipient of that information is kept appraised of that too. 
Now, as Henry said quite rightly earlier, it's a great way of staying out of dispute. But the flip side to that is, it's a great way to prepare for a dispute. Because if you can turn around and say, I've diligently notified um, these events, you've been kept up to date on, on, on a very regular pro um, basis, then you're in a very good position if your applications for an extension of time are denied or ignored. I mean, the law is a complicated beast, and there's lots of sort of case law around this. But I mean, in in simple terms, the the kind of the the main delays that you would expect to see in a project, what what would they be? There are ones that fall exactly as uh, are defined under, <coughs> say, for the JCT under Section Two. The most common one that a contractor or any party who wants to claim has to ask themselves is has there been any prevention, impediment or default to them carrying out the works information or the works activities that is preventing them from completing on the stated date. So JCT section 2, that was a bit sort of legalese. <laughs> yeah. what, what, what do you mean there? Yeah, JCT is split down into certain sections. Time and delay is dealt with specifically under section 2 of that contract. Do people understand what JCT is? A joint Contracts Tribunal, and it's a standard form contract. We often heavily amend it. We amend it on behalf of developers, and we advise on the merits and how to actually properly incorporate, how to properly administer and use those clauses. Okay. Yeah, just to add to that, um, people can get caught out with uh, amendments. And so it's very important that at the start that, as we've said before, that you work collaboratively and prospectively and make sure that any amendments um, are, are picked up properly and interface properly with the contract, because those can affect your ability to either apply and successfully get an extension of time. Especially uh, with time bars, Lachlan. Indeed, yes. I mean, they're critical, frankly. Yeah, in a standard form contract, Sean, like NEC, for example, NEC, three is, a, is one example where there's a time bar. If you don't raise your claim in time within eight weeks under standard form, you've lost all your rights later on to ever try and make a claim thereafter. Uh, that's called a compensation event. There is no such time bar in the standard form of a JCT contract, but generally heavily amended, those time bars will be introduced. That's important because if you don't get it right, you don't get your notifications in on time, and operate within those rules, you could find yourself that you've nothing at all. And how costly could that be? I mean, have you and had exams? It, it's we've we've seen instances, Sean, where it has been actually directly um, resulting in companies becoming insolvent and um, going out of business. And ultimately, when they get themselves into this problem, they really do need to recognise how costly it is and the damage it could do to their business. I mean, to, to put things in perspective and picking up on that, we've seen claims where the actual claim for extension of time on the resultant expense that, that might go along with that actually far outweigh the initial contract sum. So getting this right is really key to um, the, the health, financial health of a company and its ability to continue to trade, certainly. Ultimately, why it's so important um, in relation to the, a contractor, for example, getting his extensions of time so right is the underlying threat. If he doesn't get an adjustment to the completion date, he could always be exposed to liquidated damages under the contract. Mm. That's the penalty. That's Well, it's not, well, of course, it's not a penalty, as we say, but that is the underlying position, the financial consequence to the contractor if he can't adjust. The purpose of the extensions of time properly uh, taken into account is to relieve the contractor from being levied liquidated damages. And that's the financial position in relation to the uh, the contractor. You just pick up this point again about um, delay analysis and and the, the sort of techniques really for sort of measuring, looking at this. I mean, in sort of fairly broad brush terms, what what are they? Well, on a very basic level, what you'd be looking to do is to have your program um, and then plot against that the delays that you're encountering uh, and what impact you effectively aggregate the delays and you, you demonstrate the impact of those as against what you thought you were signing up to or what you ought to have built. So on a very basic level, that's one method of saying what we should have done and what we actually did. Yeah. I mean, you pick a lot of this up, I guess, in, in, in the seminars, the breakfast seminars that you mm. carry. Is this a sort of particularly hot topic for people? Uh, it is, um, driven in part by the changing judgments that we've had uh, in recent times. You know, people will often come up and say, oh, which case is favoured now? Um, and there are quite a few, depending Especially on... Especially with concurrent delays. Concurrent yeah. delay. Well, that's a bit of a minefield, um, but, uh, as, as, we, as we know. Um, 
Is that something that you just want to sort of pick up on there? So you jumped in there just to explain? Yeah, no, like no, as Lockdown was exactly right, like know that there there has been a lot of debates, like a current delay is when both parties are in delay and it's trying to attribute who actually is the fault of that and who has to take the risk. But we've got all of these different instances that we have to, as lawyers, apply to the problem and ultimately to get to the solution. I think the, uh, the, the sort of issue that you're, you're t- touching upon there as well, I mean, I find it interesting about this whole sort of supply chain, if you like, and how, and how people are affected. And you, perhaps people wouldn't be aware of that. Um, but there's this sort of phrase about sort of, you know, liquidated damages. Can you, can you just walk us through what that means? Yeah, liquid, liquidated damages is an, an express agreement between the parties that if, say, for example, a contractor fails to complete by the completion date as set out in the contract, then the employer is entitled to levy liquidated damages. Liquidated damages is a set amount agreed by the parties that becomes payable to the employer by the contractor upon not reaching the completion date. So it's sort of, it's a kind of guarding against risk, I suppose. The employer does not have to demonstrate loss. That is one of the most common questions we're always asked by contractors. I am being levied or there is a threat of being levied liquidate damages, but the employer hasn't demonstrated its loss to me. Uh, ultimately, it's an express agreement. The employer doesn't have to demonstrate loss. It's a pre-agreed set amount payable upon not reaching the completion date. And there are many techniques to argue about those points, but ultimately um, they may become payable. And the only manner to actually resist against that is by having a good extension of time claim properly drafted, properly particularised, but moreover properly evidenced. And that's something that you have to agree at the outset, would you say, in order to make that valid? Well, it's um, what has to be agreed upon, if more often than not, is that the parties will agree upon what would be the events that gives rise to the uh, extension of time okay. and what are delaying events. That certainly would be one of the key points that they would agree to at the time of contract. No, that's entirely right, Homie. And it's about what was agreed, what were the intentions, the patterns of behaviour then get codified. But I think just to pick up more on the liquidated damages point, um, there is an argument um, against liquidated damages in that you can say that they are a penalty. Now, the law has just changed recently on that, and what that says is um, that if it would be unconscionable in the commercial context, um, it would not apply between the parties. Of course, better than that is to agree a rate from the outset, that not that you're happy with, because let's face it, who's happy with being told you're going to have to pay this money potentially, but a rate that is acceptable between the parties that they can agree upon. Um, if we look at this, um, liquidated damages can apply um, on a sectional basis, so not just throughout the whole project in, in one go, but if the project is split up, liquidated damages can apply between those milestones on the contract, and that comes with its own difficulties as well. That does sound hugely complicated. I mean, how on earth do you do you stipulate this? How on earth do you agree that at the outset? Well, the key is in good preparation in your amendments or, or the drafting and when you're filling in the contract, because... A poorly drafted sectional liquidated damages clause could actually render time being at large, as we've discussed before. So the penalty falls away totally, and the contractor is then given a reasonable time to complete the works. Um, just wondering if you've got examples of this, maybe something that you've dealt with or, or something you heard of where you know, this issue of time has, has come up and actually torpedoed a project, torpedoed a, a company. I mean, what was... Sean, it's absolutely... It, it's so predominant, it's so regular. Um, the And as I said right at the outset, the trends continue to be the same. Now, to kind of answer the question as well, most people, when they approach programming and, and projects about how they derive their timelines... They see the programming as part of good management as to what has to happen in the future. We say that properly constructed, properly evidenced about these events, a good program can be the basis of making a claim or defending a claim. And that works both ways. Again, it comes back to the whole instance of what is the quality of the evidence? Do we understand the trigger points of when these events occur? And how do we properly evidence? The key message that we always say to quite a lot of our clients is to have all of their people who work for them understand when is there a delay event actually occurring and do they actually understand that a delay event has occurred. It might sound very, very straightforward, 
but it's not always captured. And it's probably one of the most important points that they actually realise something is happening and to do something about it. Great. OK, well, we're going to have to leave it there, I'm afraid. There's a lot to talk about and a lot to think about. But if you want to find out more or get in touch with either Lachlan or Henry or a member of the Silver Shemmings Ash team, then go to the website silverllp.com or don't forget the breakfast seminars too. And once again, thank you to our contributors, Henry Hathaway and Lachlan Steer, and thank you for listening. <laughs>